so now to solve the problem that is the X-Men movies, I've brought in my friend Connor Goldsmith, who probably knows and cares more about X-Men than anyone else I know. Connor, thanks uh, for being with us today. You're welcome. I do uh, care a lot about it. My father is a, uh, a, not a comic book collector generally, but specifically an X-Men collector from like 63 to... 95-ish when he lost interest, as most people did. Um, Wasn't but, uh, really into, um, oh my god, Executioner's the, Song? Executioner's Song is like the cutoff. Um, I think actually he got up through AOA, and then he was kind of done after that. Okay. Um, but so I grew up essentially speaking X-Men as my first language. Like, I, uh, I have a creepily encyclopedic knowledge of like 80s X-Men people older than me are always just like why do you know this much about Candy Southern and I'm like well you know I just do that's um, that's great yeah I, I, I wish I had that yeah I mean I wish that you know it was I wish that more of us did because whenever I talk to people our age I'm about 30 as you are we went to college together. Yeah. Um, about the X Men, uh, it's always sort of like, dee -dee 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 which like it was great. That, that, it that was, was super great. That, that was my introduction. It's not my like primary because I would read my dad's like back issues from the eighties when he had like a really good one in plastic. I could read like the one the copy that was not so right, good. and that, that's the so, better stuff. Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, and I'm not trying to knock the cartoon. It was a it was a gateway drug to superheroes for a lot of people, which it, I think is it, it was. was good. It was. Uh, but yeah. I mean, my gateway drug was the 60s Batman. And so, oh, well, and, that's, uh, see, that's weird, though. You're old, too. You're yeah. also, like, a weird old person. Exactly. And so I was, like, digging out, like, 80s Batman back issues. Right. But yeah, I would say, like, my X-Men, like, thing is, like, the Claremont period, like, 70s and 80s, and then the Morrison, uh, like, new X-Men in right. 2000. And I also read that when it was... To, yeah, when I, yeah, me too. And to me, that was, like, the apart from the Claremont period, like, the most successful... X-Men, period. We're on the same page. Yeah. And so for now, um, I want to go through like mm -hmm. what, we, what we've agreed upon as like the key, like, let's say, to establish this now, if if the next X-Men movie was canceled, the, Which, the, the it, Dark it, Phoenix movie. I love Sansa Stark, but please don't do this movie. It, it doesn't seem like a good idea. And so <laughs> continuing from where we, where we left off with the continuity we've gotten and with Fox clearly not wanting to do a hard reboot, even right. though that would be the best move. Obviously. These are what we've narrowed down to, like, the key things that if they implemented all of these, they could fix the X-Men series. And so the first thing is a POV character. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that the earliest X-Men movies tried to do this initially with, with Rogue, uh, which I thought they, was not done very well, um, because the thing is, so the, the Claremont uh, X-Men had two of these young girls who were like 14 and who come to join the X-Men are sort of our point of entry in it. Kitty Pride is the most prominent one. Obviously she first comes in in Dark Phoenix Saga actually. Um, so it's not that they always had this, but I would say the most, the stuff people remember most. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Kitty Pride comes in and she is sort of the audience's viewpoint. And then uh, in 88, 89, he brought in Jubilee because Kitty had by that point uh, become a more self-assured and sort of adult character and had gone off to Excalibur. So right. it was, you needed to do, which was the British uh, X-Men, which I actually liked best. It's like not a good book, but it's like a wonderful book. Um, and, and, and I loved Captain Britain and Megan and all that weird stuff. But at that point, Kitty's off in England, so you need a new one, and he brought in Jubilee, and Jubilee was like... You know, if Kitty Pride, who was sort of like from, was like a Jewish girl from Scarsdale, mm -hmm. um, and was like a much more sort of like to the direct like New York comic book market reader kind of person, um, then Jubilee was a little bit more modern after that. Like, was she was Chinese? She was from California. She had been on the streets for all. She was more streetwise. Um, you know, and she had more of an opportunity to bring a different perspective to the to the team as opposed to Kitty who was just sort of like, wow. Right. Um, and, and the way the movies did it, it's like they introduced Rogue as the POV and then she and immediately just led them to Wolverine. Exactly. Like she she's just because the both Kitty and um uh Jubilee obviously attached themselves to Wolverine and to and to Storm in Kitty's case. But you know, the Wolverine with like a teenage girl like Robin to his Batman, basically, right. was sort of a mainstay of the franchise. And that's what they try to do with Rogue. The problem is, first of all, like you point out, 
almost immediately Rogue steps into the background because Wolverine is so charismatic and beautiful in Hugh Jackman that they're not interested anymore. But also they made Rogue kind of a wet blanket boring character. Yeah. And this isn't Anna Paquin's fault because like obviously she's been very good in other things. But um, I mean she has an Oscar that she won when she was like 10. But you know I, what they the problem is Rogue the reason they use Rogue presumably is because A her power is traumatic so as like a puberty metaphor it's interesting. But also Rogue was really popular at the time because of the 90s cartoon. But in the 90s cartoon, she's like a Southern belle with a giant Delta Burke bouffant who's like always mad at everyone and flying around with Ms. Marvel powers. She's fun. And she's fun and she and she's like she's like Superman. I mean, she can fly, she has super strength, right. all this stuff. The and movie like, Anna, Rogue bears no resemblance Anna Paquin's never thrown a punch in any of these movies, as far as I know. Even in the Rogue cut of Days of Future Past, which I haven't seen, but I hear is better. Um, you know, so it's just one of those things where, and the thing that's interesting is that Evolution, the cartoon that came after the movies, which is sort of based a little bit on the movies, right. that rogue is also like kind of a sullen goth with no powers, but they made it interesting because they leaned into it. I mean, they made her like a literal goth and yeah. were like, let's do something with this if we're going to do this. Right. So for the, for a movie... Like, our sort of central character that, you know, like, through the whole movie should really, like, not be Wolverine. Right. And, uh, it should be a young woman who is new to this world. And through whose, who, whose eyes we experience yes. this world now. And I think that the real lost potential of First Class is that Grant Morrison went back to that well when he started his X-Men with the character of Angel Salvador, who... Um, was like a Kitty Pride or a Jubilee, except like a Jubilee had been more like, here's an, a character with some issues versus Kitty. You know, Angel was like from poverty, had been abused, like this and that, was, was tough and wasn't interested in being an X-Man particularly, right. but fell into this scenario, etc. And that character, you know, she's not quite as prominent through New X-Men as those other two were, but every time the plot comes back around to the students, she's our point of entry. Yeah. And... They put her in first class. Zoe Kravitz. With Zoe Kravitz. But, and Zoe Kravitz is a great actress, but that character is nothing. It's just nothing. First of all, they made her a stripper, which I think was tacky. I mean, not, I have nothing against sex workers at all. I have many friends who are sex workers or burlesque dancers or strippers or whatever. But, um, because I live in New York and I'm gay. But, um, I, you know, I think that it was a very reductive portrayal of like this young black woman and, from and poverty. It that, was. And, yeah. she, and, she, and she also didn't do anything and she betrays the team halfway in but we never find out why and it's right. like all just really lame. So okay, th yeah. that, that, that's that point covered. Yeah. So I think we both agree a major aspect of the appeal of the X-Men over the past several decades that has been totally left out of the movies is that it's basically just a big soap opera. Yeah, absolutely. The, the thing that um, made the X-Men such a hit uh, not initially, because the 60s X-Men was not that big a hit. But the 70s X-Men, under Claremont primarily, became, into the 80s, became such a big hit because it was about these small sort of beats between characters and their relationships with one another. And so that was that was unique in, in comics at the time. Yeah. You know, I mean, uh, Spider-Man had some of that as well. But it became sort of the Marvel brand, as opposed to DC, which had sort of these more like high-flying adventures, was that Marvel was more grounded, more current, the characters wore contemporary fashions and had contemporary problems. That was sort of like what distinguished the two big companies at the time, I think, in the 80s. And that continued certainly into the 90s. I mean, the Jean Grey, Scott Summers, will they, won't they thing is as soapy as any you know, Mulder and Scully derivative relationship on a TV show now. Right. It's that element. And, you know, I think that the, the movies lose that. The, the worst thing about the Singer movies, in my opinion, and there are many things I don't love about the Fox X-Men movies, but the worst thing, I think, is because they have the rights to, like, 11 billion characters mm -hmm. that, you know, Lee and Kirby and Claremont and a million other people have created at this point, they tend to just toss them in. I mean, like what we were saying about Angel Salvador is a good example. Right. Is that like, you know, in first class, because they chose not to do a hard reboot so that they could keep Hugh Jackman and Patrick Stewart uh, for like cameos, the 
fact of the matter is they threw in a bunch of characters like Banshee and Havoc and what who those are characters with a lot of interesting things going on in in their you know comics history and and uh, personality but they're just ciphers I mean they just oh, yeah. have a name and a power that you recognize and it's I mean and even up through you know apocalypse or whatever like you know it's like well here's Psylocke she's a horseman of the apocalypse but it's like well we don't know about who she is or right. care about her she's just Olivia Munn looking hot with purple hair and a psi sword so you know it's Psylocke I've always gotten the vibe from a lot of these movies that it's almost like the people making them skimmed the comics, saw a character in their power set, and then just yeah, tossed or them like in. went to Google Images. Like right. it really feels almost that deep. Whereas the reason we care about, I mean, the Dark Phoenix is the core example here because while Sophie Turner is a superb actress, in my opinion, uh, and while Dark Phoenix is the most famous X Men story, the reason that Dark Phoenix is so good, and it is, I mean. The problem with Dark Phoenix is that it's been uh, imitated so many times that it mm -hmm. now looks, if you look back on it, it looks a bit cliche. And, you know, there are also some, some gender politics stuff that people have pointed out in the time since. But if you look at it in its context, the, the, thing, that, um, the thing that is so great about Dark Phoenix is that you care about Jean Grey. Jean Grey has been the female lead of the X-Men since 1963. And even when they replaced the whole team in the 70s, they couldn't, like, they had all of the original X-Men retire except Cyclops, and, like, five issues later, Jean comes back because you just couldn't quite do it. And even when Storm under Claremont becomes really the lead of the whole book, Jean still sort of remains, like, the emotional heart for right. a long time. And that's why it matters that you start to see her slipping. You start to see, like, the my favorite part of the Dark Phoenix saga is when, and this is a very soap opera moment, it's when um, they're talking to Kitty's father to try and get him to let Kitty come to Xavier's. And it's Emma Frost is also trying to recruit Kitty at the same time for the Hellfire Club to take her to the Hellions uh, School in Massachusetts Academy. And um, suddenly Kitty's father just, like, completely changes his mind. And Emma's really confused, and Scott's really confused, and he turns to Jean and is like, what's going on? And she's like, oh, I just psychically altered his opinion, you know? And, um, and Scott's like, what? And she's like, oh, Scott, the professor and I do this all the time. And that's one of my favorite panels ever in X-Men, because you can see Scott's like primordial horror right. at the idea not only that this occurs all the time, but that his girlfriend does this all the time, and his father figure do this all the time, and he's never really thought about it or realized that to them it's completely morally acceptable. Right. And so you watch her sort of morally degrade, but also it's Xavier's fault. And you can see this is the one thing that X-Men The Last Stand did correctly. <laughs> the one thing. And everything else about the Gene plot in that movie is terrible. But the fact that Gene's fall from grace is because Xavier is morally bankrupt and was her teacher right. is great. But so my point is you can't just introduce... Sansa Stark Jean Grey in X-Men Apocalypse and then where she's not even really a major character. No, not at all. And then have the next movie be Dark Phoenix because we don't care. And She's not the main character in, in this movie. No. At all. Yeah. Because once Jean becomes Dark Phoenix, she's the antagonist. She's right. not the protagonist. So if you want to do that, and yes, I know that technically it was retcon so that it was never Jean, but that was dumb and we're not going to talk about it. Um, you know, but if you're going to do that, like, I actually think that Singer's original plan of doing a trilogy where Dark Phoenix is in the third is the right way to go. Because you, this stuff, I mean, like... Kill Jean in, the, in X2, bring her back in X3, and do the Phoenix thing. That I, made sense. X-Men is all about, you know, long-term plotting. Yes. And um, planting seeds that Dark will pay Phoenix off later. Dark Phoenix is 20 years into the publication history of the X-Men. Right. And that's why it works. And the thing is, and... It's the capstone on that whole... For If it was a manga, it would end there. Right. Like, and the, the, the weird thing about X-Men is after that, they were like, what do we do? And that's why the Claremont era is so gets so different, is because he was like, well, I don't have anything else I can do with these characters, so I guess Storm and Wolverine are just going to do stuff now. And with Kitty. And then it became a really different book. And as we were saying earlier, the... Uh, the Marvel Cinematic Universe has to actually figure out a way to mm -hmm. create that sort of soap opera storytelling feel that the X-Men movies have not at Absolutely. all. Absolutely. We care about Bucky 
who is a completely original invention of the Marvel Cinematic Universe in terms of the Bucky that we see in these movies. Because right. the Bucky in the comic books is like a Robin-style teen sidekick. So, you know, the Bucky who is Captain America's best friend, who's this handsome soldier who's bigger and stronger than him, and then they have a role reversal and this and that, that has lit a thousand fan artist fires in the time since, um, that is an invention of Captain America the First Avenger. Mm -hmm. And... Sebastian Stan is not in very much of that movie, but you care enough that by the time Winter Soldier rolls around, those scenes between them where Steve is so horrified at what has happened to Bucky, it works yeah. because you feel the connection. So we buy the relationships between those characters in a way that yes. we... Honestly, like, what character connections in the X-Men movies do, beyond... beyond um, for, uh, Xavier I was going to say Xavier Magneto is the only one that they've ever done well, and because, it's the only, because and they just keep coming back to it movie after movie because it's all that works. Yeah, and I mean, it, well, the thing is, it was so good when it was Stuart McCallan, and then luckily for them, McAvoy and Fassbender were also very good together. Um, and now the thing is that for for the first twenty years of the X Men up through Dark Phoenix, that Xavier Magneto tension is the core conflict, mm -hmm. and so I get why they keep going back to that. Well, the problem is, what fans like is when the X Men are this weird dysfunctional family that you know has very human problems and fights with each other and fucks each other and does all kinds of human things, and it's an ensemble cast of characters that people like. This is why X Two, I think, to most people, is sort of the most successful one because it, it at that point everybody's sort of been integrated into this cast that exists and you can play a little bit. Now, they, you know, that scene where um, Wolverine and Iceman are talking in the kitchen, um, in addition to being, like, extremely homoerotic, which is why I remember it, um, is, you know, but it's that slice of life thing where it's like, here, let me chill your beer for you. Like, that's the kind of thing people like with the X-Men. Right. And the, the sort of philosophical Xavier versus Magneto debate... It's so basic. We all know what that is. And also, it's like, and this was particularly awkward in first class, you know, in the 60s, having these guys be sort of ciphers for the arguments about racial equality was, like, f f understandable. But at this point, it comes across a little bit goofy. Exactly. And it's like, we understand the... You know, we understand the super nonviolence, like this and that, straw man that you're creating, and the violent revolution is the only way, straw man that you're creating. Both are less complicated than the real MLK and real Malcolm X, obviously, but there is that element, and we all know it. So we don't need you to reiterate it again and again with these two white guys, because it's just, we, we know that those are philosophies existing in the world. Exactly. So just let them exist in the background and have the characters that we care about who are, you know, the the characters like Storm and uh, Wolverine and Cyclops and, and Rogue and Gambit, who I don't even like, but everybody seems to love because of the cartoon. Yep. <laughs> um, you know, and Kitty Pride and Jubilee and whoever. Like, let's have them just talk about this stuff instead of, like, 50 ponderous conversations between Xavier and Magneto. You know, even if the actors have great chemistry, it's just tired. It, we've had it for 20 it's years. Been, and it's been 20 years of filmmaking at this point where it's like, okay, we get it. Okay, so the next thing is, I feel like because the X-Men movies began in the early 2000s when there weren't really other comic book movies around. Just and they, Blade. Just Blade, which most people <laughs> didn't know was a comic and book. And which is, like, very, like, much more... Grounded, even, exactly. even with vampires. And so they were afraid of going too comic booky and alienating the public. Right. And so they really grounded it. We've got mm -hmm. like black leather, everything. Like, and the X Men comics are like crazy out there sci fi. Mm -hmm. There's dinosaurs. There's the, the Savage Land and Kazar in like X Men 10 right. in 1960 and three or four. That to me, especially when like, you know, the Marvel movies mm -hmm. have, they've, 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 they've shown that people like that. They, they have, I mean, they've got, I mean, like, well, even the DC movies, I mean, what Wonder Woman proved more than anything else they is put that the people mascara want... In a yeah, it's, it's that people want it to be fun. That's right. why Wonder Woman is the only the first in this DC cinematic universe that people have wanted enjoy. to enjoy. Like, yeah. have wanted to recommend to other people, I'm saying. The critics are liking because right. it has that high-flying sensibility, the exactly. sense of wonder. And the no X-Men movies have always discarded so much of the cool stuff Absolutely. from the X-Men. 
And that's and like and there's so much stuff that I want to see that we just have like we finally got Sentinels after like five yeah and they're movies. bringing in the Shi'ar now for for Dark Phoenix which will probably be a lamer version but of but, course because Apocalypse was a like more you know pedestrian version of Apocalypse like exactly the Hellfire Club in First Class is the one that really is like. <laughs> Because you know that Kevin Bacon would have been down to put on, like, weird Victorian garb and be Sebastian oh, yeah. Shaw, like, from the comics. Emma Frost is one of the most popular characters in Marvel, in part because Grant Morrison wrote her so well, and it, it reestablished the character for, like, a new generation as sort of this, you know, very fun, drag queen-y kind of character. Right. But also just because she's so bombastic and exciting. I mean, even in the 80s when she was evil, she was a popular character in yeah. Claremont. Because... She's fun. And, like, when you go to the Hellfire Club in first class and it's just, like, here's the Hellfire Club. It's a bunch of very bored women in lingerie serving Kevin Bacon some beers. Like, it's just so sad. And if you're go- and the thing is, it's the 60s. The Hellfire Club that Claremont wrote was based on an episode of The Avengers. Right. So it's not like, if you watch that episode of The Avengers, it's the Hellfire Club from the X-Men comics. Like, you could have just done it. And so there's that, and and the, the thing that like personally like bugs me even more is just the like the toning down mm-hmm. of like the more Everything. out there sci-fi stuff. Yeah. Because you know, like when we finally got Sentinels, they were like ten foot tall Sentinels instead of fifty, not fifty feet tall Sentinels. But, like there, there's yeah. no master molds building these Sentinels. There's no right. there's no Savage Land with dinosaurs where they go exactly. on like, field trips. Or like in X three when Phoenix does arise. I like that they were very, like, I, again, I like that they were very clear that it's Jean because mm-hmm. I think the retcon that it's not Jean is super bad. Right. But the fact that it's just, like, Jean's alternate personality and there's nothing cosmic about it. Like, you can have it be Jean who's tapping into the power cosmic. You could do that. I mean, Marvel's doing, like, the Infinity Stones are the most boring part of the Marvel Cinematic Universe, but no one's mad when, like, some celestial power happens. Like, you right. could do that. Yeah. And Ultimate X-Men, which was an attempt to kind of rebrand the comics in a way that was similar to the movies, did. Oh, even yeah. If it, even if it, it also toned things down, like the Shi'ar were Scientologists instead of aliens, but right. like it had the same kind of... Um, like, she was still tapping something. There were still brightly colored costumes. They were still doing stuff. And part of that owes to what I would say is is what I was saying about how they keep going back to the 60s and 70s X-Men stories, mm-hmm. which are smaller. Um, whereas, like, the most famous X-Men stories are the Claremont stories in the 80s that are things like the Dark Phoenix, for example, where they go to space. Or the X-Men go to Asgard, which was a huge thing that is very memorable for the New Mutants in particular. Or Inferno, where, like, New York is overrun with the armies of hell. You know, these are things that people remember because they're huge. Right. And the X-Men was sort of uniquely deployed to do this because mutant powers could be anything. So you could just sort of have them do whatever you needed to do to serve this huge plot. Right, and the X-Men, even within the Marvel Universe, pretty much had their own little universe. With, yes, like, this I elaborate actually am, I'm not someone who thinks that we should put the X-Men in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. As a big X-Men fan, I think they work best when they're cordoned off. I'm, I'm with you. Um, because like, when you do things like Civil War, the comics Civil War, and you know they're all complaining about like whether or not they need superhero licenses and you know there is a great scene where iron man goes to emma frost and she's like we've been like genocided a lot for like 30 (laughs) years so i don't really know what you expect me to to do here but i think you guys should handle this yourselves but the fact that they have to have that scene is because the x-men are sort of doing their own story and like it disrupts the X-Men story if the Avengers can show up right. to stop Genosha from being destroyed. So very they can't few, do that. Very few of like the great X-Men stories involve the Almost rest of the none. Universe. Almost none. Mutant Massacre has a has a Thor issue in the middle that's pretty good. Um Spider-Man has occasionally factored into the X-Men stories, the Fantastic Four occasionally, but nothing that's, like, really that big. We don't need it. And for me, like, there's this... It Though makes... Misty Knight as Jean Grey's roommate in the 70s, I do love. <laughs> that is a wonderful Chris Claremont piece of magic. There is that. And, and <laughs> for me, it's just because they're still working off of, like, the, uh, the foundation that Singer built in the early 2000s. Which is the 60s framework of, basically, these pretty white teenagers are secretly black. It's like an imitation of life kind of right. motif that was what the 60s story was doing because it, the point was to make white kids reading comic books care about racial justice, and it was written by 
Jewish men and they wanted to sort of, and now obviously Jewish people, and I am of Jewish descent myself, like, you know, there is that thing where you're white, but you're also this other thing right. that people are racist about. So One second, we're going to get into that in the next oh, section. I won't get ahead of myself, but... Um, and um, I'm just really thinking, like, uh, just in terms of, this is like purely like surface level stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just that... The, the the imagination seems so limited. Yeah, I'm just saying that in... that secrecy plot that I'm hiding who I am because right. of a bigotry storyline is the very basic X Men storyline of the 60s and early 70s. But it's not again. It's not what is most popular about the X Men, and they yeah. keep going back to that well because it's what Singer established at the beginning. Right, and and, and and I feel like and in Apocalypse when they did try to get a bit bigger. It, just, it, it felt gel. It felt really out of place in yeah. that world that had been it built. It feels like it's stapled on. It feels like it's like, well, we know you like the Marvel Cinematic Universe now, so here's a big CGI battle. Right. But it doesn't feel emotionally connected to any of the other stuff that's happening in this, the Fox X-Men franchise because right. the Fox X-Men franchise has been so focused on like intimate but weirdly not intimate because you don't ever get to know anything about the characters, but like that kind of small-scale thing. So now there's the matter of mutants. So in all the movies that we've got so far, uh, mutants have been kind of, and especially like how humanity views mutants, mm -hmm. has been always portrayed the same way. It's the mutant way. menace. It's the threat or menace thing. Right. From the 60s and Where 70s. they're very yeah. underground. And, and no one knows about them yet, really. Right. Yeah. Right. Or they're just finding out and it's a big like moral panic. Exactly. And I feel like it's time to move beyond that. I would agree. And for me, like I think, especially going to uh, the Grant Morrison era. Yeah, from I early think 2000s. that I think that Morrison is maybe the only uh, X Men writer who ever made mutants feel like a legitimate minority subculture. Because mm -hmm. um, he, he introduced had, Mutant Town. Yeah, Mutant Town, which was like you know like a neighborhood in New York City that was like a mutant ghetto, like right. where mutants were making their own businesses and and living their own lives, and people who were like very obviously like unlike the Morlocks, it's actually like a very sharp dividing line because mm -hmm. in the Claremont X Men and Claremont did this well in certain respects. As well, I mean, that's why part of why that book is so successful is that by the '80s, people knew about mutants, and you know, you have things like Rogue is trying to buy makeup, and people are like, "I heard she's a mutant. She flew in here," you know, and it becomes like a mob thing. And Kitty Pride standing up to mobs right. was like a big part of the '80s stuff. But in terms of mutants, like not just being feared, but also being subjects rather than objects in the world, mm -hmm. um, I would say that Morrison did this most effectively because in Mutant Town, whereas Claremont had the Morlocks, who were these like visually. Because, uh, well, to go way back to the 60s, like, the original X-Men characters, if you look at them, are a set of very beautiful um, white teenagers from the suburbs of New York. And that's because the metaphor in the original 60s X-Men is, I mean, it was two Jewish guys writing about race, right? Yeah. And their idea, when you're Jewish, which I, I am partly of Jewish descent myself, um, when you are Jewish, you're white in, in a visual sense, but you also have this other thing that, you know, people are racist about that's like a secret or not a secret, but when they find out, they treat you differently, etc. So that element came into it, but also it was an attempt, I mean, it was the 60s, it was an attempt to talk about um, black civil rights um, and to do it sort of through this acceptable, more mainstream lens of having these pretty white kids talk about it. And that's honestly why the X-Men always works better when it's about Storm and Kitty Pride, who are actually black and Jewish, as opposed to, that's why the 80s is so much more powerful a lot of the time. But mm -hmm. to go back, you know, I think that that is when he, when he brought in the Morlocks, it was to say, well, okay, but these mutants don't have a lot at stake. Like, they could just pass if they wanted to. And the Morlocks are people who, like, have horns or scales or whatever, and they have to live in the sewer because everyone will kill them if they don't or whatever. Right. And what Morrison did was he had those, he's like, those people wouldn't live in the sewer. They would say, fuck you, and start their own thing. So you have, like, Jumbo Carnation, the mutant fashion designer who's, like, making fashion for people with horns. Or you have, like, musical artists who are... Because Dazzler, who was the big musical artist, in when she's introduced, she's hiding that she's a mutant. Everyone right. thinks she just has really great laser light shows. But when you lean into it, it's like, well, now there are all these human kids who think mutants are cool. And that's sort of a more modern way to talk about the other and to talk about difference. Because obviously black culture, while being, you know, degraded by white supremacy as, as inferior, is also elevated in this sense that 
people think it's cool and they want a piece of it and they want to appropriate it. So what Morrison did was basically make mutancy sort of iconoclastic and interesting and something that people were like intrigued by at the same time they didn't want it too close to them. Right. And it really feels like to me like right now like in that's this current so much time, more current yeah like uh they're, they're they have this this great i mean obviously you know mutants have always been like some some kind of metaphor but right. it could be a way more potent metaphor right Absolutely. now that it's being used and if for. you and if you want to do stuff about mutant activism now like the way to do it is not you can't just have this sort of very domestic story where you know i mean they're doing this new tv show Gifted. Yeah. And I love Amy Acker. She's one of my favorite TV actresses. But, like, the idea that they're going to do another, like, have you tried not being a mutant? Like, parents it's like he, and their people kids. like, on show. the run because, because they're, they're mutant. Right. Whereas, like, if you want to tap into the current moment politically and to our generation, to, like, the millennials and all that, like, what you want to do is tap into, you know the anti-fascist movements that are arising in the in the wake of the most recent election. You want to tap into Black Lives Matter. You want to tap into gay civil rights and, and trans civil rights as they are now. Like, those are sort of the liberal movements and progressive movements that are happening at the moment. And, um, you know, I think that if you want mutants to feel now and not to feel like we're doing the same thing for 20 years, you did this in the first X-Men movie, that you need to lean more into the Morrison interpretation where it's like, well, mutants are here. They're not going anywhere. People have accepted that even if they don't like it. Mm -hmm. And now mutants are building their own culture and are, you know, the one of my favorite uh, new X-Men storylines that Morrison did is uh, the U-Men, John Sublime, which is humans who literally like capture mutants and uh, like remove like their wings or their like magic eyes or whatever and have... Uh, uh, um, I'm sorry, transplantations done. They get they get the organs transplanted in them to try and become mutants themselves. Right. And it doesn't work. I mean, it, it, it just kills everybody, both the, the mutant and the human. But it's that, that desire. These same people who hate mutants and who see them as fodder for parts also, like, really want to be them. And I think that that is, a, is just much more... It's just much more of the moment. I mean, I just think oh, we've yeah. moved beyond... Even if, it, it, it's not to say that the struggles of the 60s are over, because they're certainly not. Um, but I think that the, the white societal understanding of race has moved beyond that like very basic, look who's moved in down the street thing that the X-Men were doing in the 60s. All right, and now to get very, very surface level, let's talk about the aesthetics of the X-Men, because again, for years, we've just been rooted in that same, When like, was the last time you saw anyone cosplaying a character from the Singer Fox X-Men movies, apart from Naked Mystique? I was at San Diego Comic-Con this year. No one. Zero, Not right. a yeah. single yeah, person. Yeah, yeah. Not a single one. Yeah, no one is into the black leather jumpsuits, and even at the end of Apocalypse, they tried to finally update it and uh -huh. get a little bit comic booky. Cyclops finally has a blue and yellow costume. Right. But... It's still these like chunky armor pieces that don't look good. And look at what you can your it's the Batman versus Superman problem where it was like everyone was saying, Why this is the Justice League. Why are they so why is the palette so muted? Right. And the Marvel Cinematic Universe, while it still has a somewhat muted palette, has at least started moving away from that. Like finally the Falcons in red. You right. know? <laughs> like, they, they found a really good way of managing to take like the general designs but make them look fun. Because the actual Spandex comic from the costume is gonna look pretty silly in live action a lot of the time. With but the, except from Spider Man. With, you yeah, who with you can get away with it and Deadpool because it's basically a Spider Man costume meets yeah. a Deathstroke, the Terminator costume. Exactly. Um, you know, it also works. But for the most part, you know, the like like Jean Grey in a like green and gold lame Phoenix costume would look absurd in real life. Mm -hmm. um, much as cosplayers may make it work as a fun thing because we know the comic book, but in a in a movie in a blockbuster film, it would look a bit silly. Right. But that doesn't mean that the way like that doesn't mean that you have to put her in like a black leather cat suit and not do anything else. Like, there yeah. has to be a happy medium there. I actually think that the Deadpool movie is a good example of them doing it right. I mean, so much about the Deadpool movie feels like a sort of a soft reboot course correction. Which is crazy um, because it's technically 
canon. Well, in right, the except X-Men it movies. can't be. And right. there are lots of contradictions within the whole canon. Like, there's like two Emma Frost, neither of whom are good. I mean, and let's be clear: X Men movie continuity is terrible. No it sense. makes no sense. It makes no sense. But Havoc is at, like 40 years older than Cyclops, but still played by a 25 year old. Right. The whole thing. So is Cyclops a, is a teen in both Apocalypse and in the first Wolverine movie. Right. It makes no sense. It doesn't make any sense. But you look at like Colossus in Deadpool. That's not the Colossus from the X Men movies not, at all. But he's but in he an X uniform. It, and he's in the he. And and Negasonic Teenage Warhead are wearing the navy and yellow classic X-Men look. Right. And, and, and it works. It looks good. I mean, good. he's not in the... But you get what I'm saying. He's in a uniform that looks like Colossus. It's like Cops. black and red, and, but, but it's an X-Men But it's an X-Men uniform. uniform. And she's in the very classic, this is what they put the, the New Mutants in when they arrived at the school kind of outfit. Exactly. Um, and that's just that movie. You know, I don't particularly care for Deadpool that much as a property. But that movie is so specifically what I want from X-Men movies. Right. That it, I can't help but love it. It, it, it still he, blows my mind that somehow, like, of all the movies to get it right, it's the well, Deadpool Well, it, it movie. actually makes sense to me, because the thing about Deadpool as a... The reason Deadpool has become this phenomenon in, in the comics fandom is that he's funny, his design is very um, iconic. Yeah. And, you know, it's those two things, really. And when they did Deadpool and they cast Ryan Reynolds for, the, for that terrible Wolverine movie... Everyone was really excited because Ryan Reynolds was hot at the time um, as, as like a young actor and had that kind of sense of humor thing. Like he had just done that movie with Sandra Bullock, The Proposal, which I love. Um, and, you know, it's one of those things where it felt perfect. But then in the movie, it was like he, first of all, they took, like they made him like a mute killer, which is like the, the thing you They take, literally sewed his mouth shut. <laughs> right, like you can't take Deadpool's mouth away. That's what everybody wants. So... What what really did that was fans demanding for years after that a more faithful Deadpool movie. Right. And that's because he's so popular. And because of that, they were able to sort of... They said to themselves, well, you know what? What the fans want with this movie is the comic book. Which, it's baffling that they didn't realize that at any point previously yeah, with the X-Men and, movie. And they took the but, costume exactly and put it yeah, on screen. And then you look at, in like, the, like... In the Deadpool 2 stuff, Cable, Cable looks exactly like the comic. Domino also looks exactly like the comic. I mean, I... I you know, there's some racists mad that they flipped the color scheme, but I think she looks incredible. She looks great, and um, I actually love the flipping of so it's... Like I think a, that like she, a, like she's black spot. and has a vitiligo, but great. I think it's really smart, because I think Domino is a good example of a character that would look really weird in live action if you did the comic book version, where she's yeah. like chalk white with a black spot. But, like, but, but you look at those movies, and they found a way to really accurately it translate... It looks like the comic book. It, it does, and, and it works those, in live I mean, action. Every picture... Um, of those characters. Like, I mean, like, Rob Liefeld, who is notoriously hard to please with any interpretation of his characters, thinks it looks great. He's overjoyed. He's overjoyed. And, but, and that's the thing. He's one, he is basically, like, a fan who is picky about things being close to the comic books, and right. he's happy. But, you know, what they also did with Deadpool, I mean, Negasonic Teenage Warhead, to go back, is a good example. They did a Marvel Cinematic Universe type thing with some of the characters. Like, Negasonic Teenage Warhead in the comics is a very minor character from the Morrison run. She's one of Emma Frost's telepathy students who looks completely different from that character and who dies in her first appearance and her death in the genocide in Genosha is what sort of inspires Emma Frost to give up teaching again and or to go teach at Xavier's and also be an X-Man and right. whatnot, even though she thinks that, like, she calls it ex-liberalism and she finds, like, X-Men, the X-Men kind of stupid because she's more of a radical herself. Um, but, you know, the, the they took the name because it's a cool name. They gave her a completely new power that matches the name better. Mm -hmm. And they did a whole new design. It's a whole new character. They took something. They took a small kernel from the comic, gave you something that's new. It's like what I was talking about with Bucky. Bucky doesn't, isn't like the comic character, but he's recognizably a Marvel Comics character. Yes. You feel like he belongs. And Negasonic Teenage Warhead feels like an X-Men character in a way yeah. that most of the singer characters don't. You're just sort of like, oh, this is like, it would, this could be a character in the vein of Kitty and Jubilee and Angel Salvador. Like, this could be your little, like, and sh this one is, like, kind of a bitch and kind of rude or whatever. But, like, that would be a fun take. You right. could do, like, something new with it. Like, but it feels that way. Her and Colossus feel like Wolverine and his teen girl sidekick, like, having an adventure. Yeah. And that's the X-Men to me. That is, and Deadpool wasn't perfect. I mean, I was annoyed that they made Vanessa Carlyle just a girlfriend instead of, like, the assassin copycat. Because, mostly because I love Marina Bacarin. And uh, I would have loved to see her play, like, a sexy assassin right. character. But, you know, 
whatever, that's, that's life. I'm just saying in general, what they did was they took the source material, made it visually and directorially feel like the source material. Right, it looks right, it feels right. But they updated it. They added things, they changed things. You know, I, I think that that's really the, the way to go, is that Deadpool movie. And what's weird is you could feel, you can feel the possibility of building an X-Men franchise around that movie if you yeah. just ignored all the other X-Men movies. Right, and it's like, I think <laughs> if you can take the Deadpool costume and just put it on screen as like a thing that, that it's like, it's tangible and functional, yeah. you can make a Cyclops costume. Absolutely, like just do, quite honestly, do what the Marvel Cinematic Universe does. I mean like Captain America's costume in those movies is recognizably Captain America's costume. It doesn't yeah. have the scale mail, and it doesn't have the wings on the side of his head, but you put you paint the wings on the side of the head like a hub decal, right. and we get it. Like for me, if I took my glasses off, and so everything is a little bit blurry, yeah. it still looks like the same thing. Like the, like the exact details are the same, right. but generally it's the same There's thing. There's no reason why you couldn't, I mean, even like, like Apocalypse for all its faults, when you know, and this, and I'm I'm more of a fan of the '80s Psylocke before they did the weird racist body swap storyline. But um, if you're like when Olivia Munn walks out in uh, in the tra trailer initially in her like you know Jim Lee thong from the '90s, everyone just went, "Oh my God, it's Psylocke!" Like in a way yeah. that no one really felt about most of these movies because, about anything else because in that series. Yeah, because it's just like, "Oh wow, there it is." And that shouldn't be so hard. It shouldn't be so hard. Like, Storm is a great example. That is a character that is so easy to render iconically. She has big white hair. You do the contacts, and you do any one of those outfits. You do the black Grace Jones leather look. You do the white look from the 90s with the X's on her titties. You know, like... I mean, they d I, I, I was glad when they, at least Apocalypse, did have Mohawk Storm, but then yeah. she was a non-character. Yeah, yeah. Movie. I mean, I, like, for me, I don't know. I always find the casting on Storm to be not great, but that's... I don't even, I can't even give you an opinion on the, the, the I have no, I have no opinion on Alexander Ship because she didn't do much in that movie, but. She's also like possessed for the whole movie, so. Yeah, it's, it's, it's boring. Well, that's the other thing. It's like, you're going to give us Storm, but she's not a character. Like, it's like they learn nothing, I, continually from these, nothing. because one of the main criticisms of the early movies is that Halle Berry as Storm is not exciting. And Storm was the most exciting character. That's why she was the headliner in the 80s. That's right. why she, in the, in, that's why just doing the Storm voice from the cartoon will make 90s kids laugh because it's like a thunderstorm, Jubilee. Like she's so dramatic and it's fun. There's, that's why every flame con ends with a drag queen in a Storm costume. Like because it's dramatic. Right. And you know, you just have like Halle Berry in a limp Party City wig, going like, "Oh no, everyone, I'm Storm." Like this is gonna be, and it's not even her fault because it's like the way That's the character's written is boring, and the way it was directed was boring, and the costuming also is boring. Like either go Mohawk Storm, which I do prefer, or go um, or you go big. Her hair should look like a big cumulus cloud. Like it should be like fluffy Farrah Fawcett-y kind of thing going on. Right. Or go like full Pam Greer afro. Like do something interesting yeah. with it. And basically at this point there's no excuse. Just for make this, her like... look big and exciting. Right. And similarly like when Jean Grey is doing psychic stuff it should look awesome. One of the best things that Grant Morrison did when he decided that the retcons about Phoenix were stupid and he was just going to say no Jean is Phoenix um, was when Jean starts using her telepathy too much and stuff like her hair kind of starts burning at the ends, or like things like like great. Just tiny visual signifiers that are so fun. And the X Men should be about that kind of fun visual because when you're reading the comic books, part of what's I mean, like when Psylocke, go, everybody makes fun of Claremont's um, very expository dialogue, but I kind of love it in its way, like both for camp factor, but also because when Psylocke goes like, "This is my psychic knife, the focused totality of my psychic power," like you're kind of like, "Yeah, it is," you know, like, and then she's like, "One strike will render Magneto insensible." You're like. Yeah, it will, and that's super cool. Like, you feel it. Right. You know, there's an excitement to it. There's a drama to it. That these movies have always just sort of felt like, they're like, I can shoot lasers out of my eyes. It's very inconvenient, but <laughs> we'll do it if we have to. You know? Like, 
and even if you want to have the characters like Rogue, who has a shitty power, um, you know, feeling insecure or bad about their powers, it, you need to do it in such a way that's fun for the viewer to watch. I mean, I actually think, you know, much as their interpretation of the Scarlet Witch's powers don't really make any sense, the Marvel movies with, like, you know, Elizabeth Olsen, like, shooting weird red stuff all over the place, it yeah. looks great. Yeah. Or, like, the Vision flying, or, like, it looks awesome. Just do, make it cool. Just make it cool. This shouldn't be hard. Yeah, it's that simple. It's just that simple. And now something that I know you care deeply about. Yes. The roster for oh, the yes. X-Men. It's, uh, you know, we had all... They've we, never hit the mark. They really have not. Um, I mean, I, you know, I... So my favorite X-Men roster, because I'm weird, is the Australian uh, roster from the 80s. Um, I, mean, which, I can't remember what that is. So, okay, so after Fall of the Mutants, when um, a bunch of the X-Men die to stop the adversary, Roma, the uh, Omniversal Guardian, uh, resurrects them and sends them to like a magical base in Australia with um, their sort of magical Aboriginal guide gateway. Um, that was not great. Retroact, respectively. Um, but, uh, you know, the, the, the team is it's Storm and Psylocke and Colossus and Havoc and Dazzler and Rogue and Longshot. Um, and Dazzler and Longshot are kind of like off doing whatever, you know, 80s shenanigans at any given time. But Storm and Wolverine are sort of like, you know, Storm's the leader, but she and Wolverine are sort of arguing about stuff sometimes. Um, Psylocke and Havoc were really interesting because this is classic English Rose Psylocke before she became the walking embodiment of colonialism. Um, and, uh, you know, she is, she actually was a lot like Emma Frost is now. Okay. Um, she was the pragmatist who was a little bit unethical with her telepathy, um, who was a little bit like, you know what, we're like, our people are in, in danger and we're going to do what we have to do. And Havoc was a little cyclopsy and was kind of like, meh, 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 meh. and they had a flirtation that was interesting also. Um, and she and Colossus had a really great friendship because he was an artist and she was sort of a patron of the arts. It's funny what you're saying, like, oh, they had a flirtation, oh, they had a friendship. These things are so absent to the in, movies, in right? The no. And the most interesting thing about the Australian team to me is uh, that Madeline Pryor was there. As in, this was when she was just a human woman who was Scott's wife that he'd abandoned to get back with Jean. Okay. And she dies with them in Fall of the Mutants. She sacrifices herself, and she's like, Scott, please find our baby, because Mr. Sinister had taken the baby. It was the whole thing. Um, but she, uh, so she became sort of their, like, Lois Lane or Sue Dibney character, and she ran all their comms and stuff from the oh, base in Australia. Okay. Um, and I love that whole moment. Like, first of all, taking it to Australia, like, it was so different from the West. I mean, I grew up in Westchester, New York. I actually grew up in um, the part of Westchester that is like exactly where Salem Center would be if it existed. Right. So I always was like, oh, where the X-Men are from? <laughs> um, you know, but uh, so to me, that was p perhaps part of why I was so engaged so readily was that I was like, oh, this is right here. Right. Um, but also it was a little pedestrian for me. So taking it like now we're here and it's totally different. We're in the outback. We're like, you know. So that was fascinating, but also the character dynamics there are great because you have all these different kinds of people who have different motivations and they were on a secret mission basically because the whole world thought they were dead at the time. Because, right. you know, so that roster I love. But, but what, what's really important is sort of stressing all the different character types that you have there. And I, I think I, that- I was gonna say, so what do you think is key to like a good X-Men roster? Yeah, so I think you need I think you need the sort of stick in the mud Boy Scout, which tends to be a Summers brother in any given incarnation. Um, I think you need a woman who pushes things morally a little bit, and that's with Psylocke, and now it's usually Emma Frost, um, but who sort of plays off that character. Mm -hmm. um, and Jean Grey even also was that when she was phoenixing, because she would, right. she would be the one who was like, no, Scott, it's fine. I can totally control the earth and be God, and it's totally okay. <laughs> and to counterpoint that, because, you know, if that was the only female character, it would be a little bit like snaky women in the garden yeah. or whatever. You also, I, I mean, I think Storm. <laughs> like, I, I, I'm trying to make it an archetype, Storm's but I just, be there. Storm's gotta be there. Um, and you should put her in the leadership role because that's where she's most popular and she's the most popular leader the X-Men have ever had. And just do it. Just do it. 
um, there's nothing to, I don't, I don't know if they're worried about, you know, having a black woman be the lead. I don't know what it is, but they've always shied away from that. Well, and in, in, a, uh, uh, in the third X-Men movie, um, they, they kind of did make Storm leader, but that was really, she barely does anything. I think, oh, she does. I, and I, I she's just more prominent. I think that was because right. Halle Berry had just won an Oscar. And Halle Berry had like, just won an Oscar we, and they were like, oh, okay. There. Well, and also they killed Cyclops in the first five minutes because they were mad at him for doing Superman Returns. Right. So, you know, that was the problem. But but she barely gets to do anything. No. Storm should be, I mean, the, the main person who you're looking to on the X-Men for, like, leadership should be Storm. Because right. Cyclops, while I, I think he's an interesting character, um, has never been enormously popular character because he is stiff and kind of off-putting which is what's part of what's interesting about him i think morrison really handled that well by having him have kind of like a midlife crisis about being like stiff and and off-putting and Mm -hmm. being like well i'm gonna be who what i want to be now you know and but but you know i just think if you want like and you can have that conflict storm and cyclops in conflict with each other is interesting um and so i think you need storm i think you need cyclops I think you then need a character, usually a woman, who is a little bit like less scrupulous, like sort of the Psylocke or Emma type. Right. And then I think you need someone who's like the brains of the operation, like Beast or um, like lately it's like Madison Jeffries, which like talk about like the obscure box from Alpha Flight. He's like all over the comics now. Apparently, I don't know. Oh, I'm not. I'm not, um, today. I'm not really either because I got really sick of all the Inhuman stuff. Didn't we? Um, <laughs> Haven't we all? Um, but, uh, you know, so I, I think that you need that. You need, like, a couple comic relief characters, whether that's, like, Dazzler or Jubilee or, or someone like that. Right. And you need the core POV character who's a young person, preferably... Your Kitty Pride, your, your Kitty Jubilee. Your Kitty Pride, Jubilee, Angel Salvador. And so how do you feel about, um, like, you know, older, like, you know, like the more senior X-Men and then, like, the younger... That, I think, works. I think that X-Men Evolution actually had a really good setup there, although I thought the choices of characters were weird. Like, I thought that having Scott and Jean be teenagers and Storm and Beast are teachers was, like, a very weird choice. Yeah. But, you know, it, I think that having... Um, I think that having those characters be older and then have sort of a new mutancy vibe with another right. with other characters works really well because at its core it is about a school. Yeah. Right. And I don't think that shying away from that ness is necessarily a bad thing. I think that the problem that the movies have is that they picked this very uh, you know basic core cast at the beginning that was, in fact, a smart cast to pick, which is Cyclops, Jean Grey, Wolverine, Storm. That makes sense. But then when they started trying to fit other people into it, like Rogue or Iceman or whatever, it just never quite fit right. Mm -hmm. And I think that part of that is because unlike most Marvel titles, um, because Marvel has this sliding time scale where time doesn't pass, the X-Men is really the only book where people age. Um, now, it's weird because the older characters never really age very much. Like, they're all still, like, 35 maximum. And then some younger people, like, kind of age up. But Kitty Pride has gone from, like, 14 to 25. Right. While the original X-Men from the 60s are still, like, 35. Yeah. But, you know, so it's awkward, but it happens. And one of the things that I would say defines any period of the X-Men comic books is the student class. Mm-hmm. And which is your favorite is off like, which characters you really identify with and want to see return is often based on when you started reading the X-Men and they were the students. So, like, you have people who love the, the original New Mutants cast with Cannonball and Mirage and all of those people. And then you have the people who love Gen X with, like, Monet and want Chamber to come back and all right. of that stuff. And then you have people who loved the new New Mutants book with Surge and Hellion oh, yeah. and all those people. And then X-23 kind of came in and took over that whole book. Right. But I find that, like, people tend to be, like, and it's almost age-based, but it's, like, within our generation because it depends on when you started reading the X-Men. I mean, it, it, totally, it, it's the same thing with, like, you know, are you a Kitty Pratt person or a Jubilee person? But it's what's interesting is that that's, but that's the thing is the, the kind of X-Men person you are is based on those characters, not on, because everybody likes Storm. Right. Who doesn't like Storm or Wolverine or whatever? I mean, you might get sick of Wolverine because he got kind of overexposed. But, you know, those characters, even if even if you're one of those people who, like, can't stand Cyclops, which, like, uh, you know, 
I mean, if it's about the Maddie Pryor stuff, I get you. Um, but, you know, if, in general, I'm just saying, that's a character that people aren't going to be like mad that he's in your movie. Right. But what you want, the emotional heart has always been the younger, it's almost a YA. Exactly. Book. And something that's, that's always felt And like, they're trying to do that now. They are. And something to me that's always felt like another missed opportunity is that there's like a million X-Men characters. Yes. And so with each movie, almost like if if some actor, you you know, they won't come back or whatever. Right. You, there's like you you can rotate in so many right. people. Just you can, bring in someone else. You can you can introduce you can just like have new team members in a new movie. Right. And just say and that, you know now the pro as long as you develop them. Right. Because the problem is because when I'm saying like. They've been trying to do the YA thing more. It's like mostly Brian Singer has been trying to put more eighteen-year-old like Tish students into like tight leather costumes, um, and going like Banff Nightcrawler, you know. But like what, <laughs> what is you know the the thing that they should be doing is sort of centering it there. Whereas like this, these movies are still centered around Xavier Magneto and like Jennifer Lawrence Mystique. And it's, I'm sorry, did I express my disdain for that casting enough? Mystique is such a good character, and they have just screwed her from the very jump in these movies. Oh, yeah. Um, like, first of all, the whole, like, I'm super naked all the time thing. Like, it answers the what's up with Mystique's clothes question, which is disturbing when you think about it for too long, um, because presumably she, like, makes them out of herself, which is a little bit creepy. But, you know, in general, it's just, like, it's so, like, oh, okay, she's naked. But also... You know, having her be Magneto's underling in the comic, like, Mystique is the successor to Magneto. Right. Um, and has nothing to do with him particularly. And is, like, 150 years old and is freaking awesome. So, like, then when they finally gave her a backstory... That's the other thing. If you're going to do Rogue, and Evolution got this right, if you're going to do Rogue, the most interesting thing about Rogue is that she was raised by Mystique. And that goes back to the character relationships thing we were talking about. Is, like, Mystique is interesting because of her ties to Nightcrawler and Rogue. And as their mother... Right. Both their long lost birth mother in Nightcrawler's case and their, or originally in Claremont's plan, his father, which I love so much more. But, uh, you know, Jim Shooter wouldn't let that happen. <laughs> but the question but is. The question is, like, w these characters have no connection to each other. And then when they finally did give Mystique a backstory and a connection to someone, it was to Xavier. Right. Which is like. Because everything, the, everything comes has back to, to Xavier revolve. And Xavier has to be her, like, adopted baby sister. His, I'm sorry, adopted baby sister. And you're like, why? Why does it, why center it here? I don't know. Around and, and, the and, old bald teacher. Like, and that's and, and, not the character anyone cares and about. And then Apocalypse ends with her sort of leading the this new team. It's bizarre. And I know that Jennifer Lawrence is the big... Now, it's because, in part, because they cast Jennifer Lawrence as she was becoming a rising star, and then she became the biggest movie star in the world. Right. During. So they had um, to So they the had role. to. The problem now is that, much like Wolverine, she's been so overexposed that I think she's kind of on a downturn. And now they've, like, thrown all their X-Men eggs into the Jennifer Lawrence basket, and we'll right. see what happens. And so, okay, so, <laughs> like... To, you know, and, so to wrap, and I don't think she wants to do these movies anymore, frankly. And yet she's doing another one. That's crazy. I, can't, I was shocked when they announced her. Well, they must have given her a, a lot of money. Check, yeah. yeah, and probably she'll only have to be in blue makeup for like two scenes. Yeah, it's probably like two scenes in blue makeup and then like four scenes otherwise, and then the rest of it will be like Sansa Stark. Exactly. Losing her mind. And so, okay, so, so core team. Yes. We're thinking like a Cyclops. A storm. Cyclops, storm, Wolverine. Those I think are the key. And then uh, you do someone funny, so Iceman or Dazzler or Jubilee. Right. Or Some sort like of that. like Emma Frost, Psylocke. Some or... kind of Emma Frost, Psylocke or Polaris, like exactly. morally ambiguous and then, and then, squirrel character. And then some younger people. So. And then a couple younger people, uh, like a like a Cannonball or a Sunspot or you know uh, magic. I mean, they're doing the New Mutants movie, which I would, which I hope is good. They cast the girl from the Vivitch. Which as is, uh, as magic, which I love. Also, the girl from Split. Oh, yeah. I didn't see that, but it's, it's I. Good. But but she's great in the Vivitch. Oh yeah. The witch. It's, oh, but it's two V's. Um, really good. And casting. and like, but just casting the girl from the witch as Ilyana Rasputin like made me really pleased. Um, that was good. But and but and of course the, the, the question and uh, of, like, Arya Stark as Wolfsbane. Yeah. Which is going to be weird because Wolfsbane's like a very innocent character, and we'll see how that works. Right. But, but, and, but once again, I keep like, calling them by their characters' names. That's very rude. I'm sorry, Maisie Williams. Yeah. But um, <laughs> but and once again, we don't even know. Is New Mutants going to be in continuity in con with or, Like, what I'm hoping is it's in continuity with Deadpool and not with the... And like, the, in my opinion, just soft reboot the entire franchise around Deadpool. Oh, yeah. That's, just oh, do it. All right. So now that we've figured out what a new X-Men movie would need to be good, there's the question of how do you even make that happen in this series with the 20 years 
of continuity that's been established and that already makes no sense. Well, Days of the Future Past was the best opportunity, and they didn't do it. They retconned I mean, some stuff. Well, but what they but at the end of Days of the Future Past, Hugh Jack and Wolverine wakes up in the school from X three, but Jean's alive and Scott's alive and all of that. Right. Go from there. Don't go, like, I know that you want Jennifer Lawrence and James McAvoy and Michael Fassbender, but the, the smart thing to do would have been to move forward from that point with a new team of X-Men, with the New Mutants characters or something right. like that. And, you know, I mean, I know that Halle Berry is expensive or whatever, but, like, how busy is Fumke Janssen? I love her, but I feel like she would do it. Oh, totally. You and, know what and, I mean? Like, have Jean training, and, and Ellen Page would probably do it. Oh, have sure. Have Jean and Kitty training, like, you know, these people. And But now we've got this insane thing. But they where, didn't do that instead. They went back in time again, and now it's the 80s, but again, none of the characters line up with and, the timeline from the original And apparently movies. the new one is going to be set in the 90s. Except so all set so, but part. this is the but this is the thing like Havoc is now like fifty and is still played by the kid from the new MacGyver. Yes. Like and it's, uh, Sophie Turner is twenty, I want to say in real life, something like that. Twenty twenty one, something like yeah. that. Yeah. Um. And but so if she was supposed to be like seventeen year old Jean Grey, is she now twenty seven? Yeah. It's ten years later. Well, I mean, lest we forget, it's like but, Downton Abbey, where like by the end all those characters had aged like thirty years, but they all looked exactly the same. Right. I mean, Quicksilver sat in a basement for over a decade wearing the same clothes. Yeah. It's, it's bad. It, it makes no sense. It's bad. And so. Well, Havoc, I mean, the one that really got me was in, in Days of Future Past, Havoc's in the military, right? As, like, a young soldier. He is. Except that in the 60s, he's, like, 18, 19. So it's 20 years later. Yeah. It, 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 it makes no <laughs> sense. So what I think they should do, because... And it's just to do the cute aesthetic nods to the comics, which it's, like, just do aesthetic nods to the comics. You don't have to move the timeline. That's all it's... And so, because... Um, Apocalypse left off in the 80s. Right. And so I think they should honestly just, instead of jumping forward to like the 90s, just jump like 30 years forward and just radically alter the stuff and yeah, soft reboot it. Absolutely. Like just have it be different. Yes. Well, and here's the fun thing that you could do if you did that you do Dark Phoenix with. Jessica Chastain. I mean, so... Well, Jessica Chastain as... As Jean. <laughs> the, I mean, like, the thing that is driving me crazy is they're like, when the headline, Jessica Chastain cast in X-Men Dark Phoenix, was like the meanest headline of all time. Because I think she's playing Melandra? She, uh, yes. Yeah. And like, that'll be great. She'll be fine. But like, Jessica Chastain visually is... Perfect Jean Grey. Perfect Jean Grey. But also, like, as an actress would be so great Perfect as Jean Phoenix Grey. and Dark Phoenix. Like, she would do that so well. And I think Sophie Turner will be fine, but doing Dark Phoenix with a 20-year-old is weird. Dark Phoenix is a story about a woman who, you know, had this vast power, has now unlocked that vast power, and is finding that she's slipping right. morally in how she uses it. And that's a much more interesting story to tell with an actress in her 30s or 40s than it is with a 20-year-old. Completely. But remember, what... what you know, our plan here is to erase this new Dark Phoenix movie. And, right, but, and like but we so what I'm saying is what you could that. do instead is jump from Apocalypse to now it's 2017. Recast those young kids with adult actors yeah. as Scott and Jean and Storm and everybody else. And you can just, and just people can like assume stuff happened. Yeah, over in the, the interim decades. things happened. But like you don't have to... Like, it doesn't need to be 1995 now, and right. Dark Phoenix is happening. Well, what's weird about doing that with Dark Phoenix also is that, like, First Class took a storyline from the 60s, and Days of Future Past did a storyline from the 70s. Uh, well, it's actually a storyline from the 80s. Yeah. But it was at least from the Claremont period. Like, And then Apocalypse is the Louise Simonson X Factor. Mm-hmm. So that's an 80s story. Dark Phoenix is an early 80s story. Right. It happens several years before Apocalypse because Jean Grey is back alive again for Apocalypse because mm -hmm. um, it's X Doctor. Right. So it, it feels bizarre to, if your whole conceit is we're doing these classic stories like in sort of the milieu in which the comics did them, 90s Dark Phoenix doesn't make any sense. You should be doing Executioner's Song or right. The Age of Apocalypse, actually. If True. we're gonna do a movie set in the '90s, that would make the most sense. But yeah, so you I'm could tie in with the Legion TV show. You could, you could, <laughs> which, I, which I think is great. And um, but yeah, but I, I really feel like um, just 
jump ahead a few decades. Yeah, just just, r- just sh- recast things. Just yeah. just change and stuff. And again, like I know that they're happy that they have some of these stars. Like Sophie Turner is on Game of Thrones. That's a draw. Right. And and you know um, Jennifer Lawrence is a big movie star. Uh, you could, I'm James sure McAvoy is good. Michael Fassbender is a big movie star, Oscar nominee, etc. Jennifer Lawrence has a billion Oscar nominations. But also, at the end of the day, it's X-Men. And the the name alone... X-Men should be able to sell it it without these people. Instead of bring people in. Yes. And, like, what you do there is, it's, like, just cast a new... Like, and we all love Patrick Stewart. But he's he's done. And he's, like, he's, like... Oh, but also like he, he after Logan, he said he's done. Yeah, and there's no well, and and it would be weird to bring him back after Logan, frankly. Like yeah. that was the end of you know, right? Even if it was an Elseworld story or whatever, like that was a, it was a good end functionally for Patrick Stewart's Xavier. Right. Um, but just cast a new British guy in his sixties as Xavier. We'll be okay. Just with do it. it. We'll be fine. He just has to be bald and in a wheelchair. We'll get the memo. Yeah. You know, like there's no. Honestly, and we maybe you could even... finally cast a Jewish actor as Magneto. And so, okay, I think we figured it out. Yeah. And honestly, just you know, like it's like just jump to the present. Con- and now that the timeline has shifted from Days of the Future Past, do whatever you want and and connect it to and Deadpool. connect it to Deadpool. That's it. It's so simple. All right, so now that we've figured out how to fix the existing X-Men franchise, let's step back, because what we all wish would happen... Because fuck the existing X-Men franchise. For real, <laughs> yeah. It's caused us so many headaches. Deadpool can stay. Because what we wish would happen would was just a hard reboot, start from scratch, where you can just do it right from the beginning. And so I just want to talk about, like, for each of us, like, what ideally... If we could, what we would like to see in a hard reboot X-Men franchise. You go first, because I'm going to dig in deep. Of course. And so, for me, I would immediately, like, opening title sequence, I would have it over a Dazzler concert. Where Obviously. She, where she is a big, like, out mutant pop star. And it's Kesha. Sure. It's yeah. Kesha. Kesha is Dazzler. Just to immediately announce that... It would have been Kylie Minogue if we'd done it ten years ago. But exactly. I, I love her, but I would say to be current... Kesha. Kesha. But just to immediately announce that this is very different mm-hmm. than the other X-Men movies. And I would also intercut that with some sort of like... Because um, what I would like to see is like having kind of multiple X-Men teams. Yes, and, do the um, blue and gold thing. Yeah, and so I would like to have their kind of like Strike Force team or whatever in some foreign country on some like mission there. Intercut with the Dazzler concert. And basically, I mean, most of the stuff we talked about like that we'd like to see, you know, like, uh, you know, like... Uh, the you know the the POV it's character. It's funny the way that your ta- your take is so I can I can tell you're a film. I'm a literary agent, and so I, it's funny because the way you're framing it is very filmmakery. And when I'm thinking about it, I'm like, how do I world build the new <laughs> franchise? Yeah, I'm, <laughs> I'm thinking like, what do I want, like my opening what are, what is sequence? the opening credits right? No, but keep, continue exactly. because I'm enjoying this. And so basically, so yeah, I would like you know a POV character and stuff like that. I would like to just like the X Men have been around for a while. Mm-hmm. There's history. Genosha right. is a place. And I think I would basically kind of like to have, like, a big Mr. Sinister plotline, because that just has not been done. The problem is that Mr. Sinister's super goofy, and... It, it, it is, I mean, we'd have to find, like, some... Like, I, I mean, I get it, but, like, part, part, I mean, if you go to Claremont's original plan for Mr. Sinister, Mr. Sinister and Gambit were supposed to both be the psychic projections of a child. Good lord. Who was... Yeah, no, that's the whole... So it was... It's the reason that Cyclops associated Mr. Sinister with memories of the orphanage was it was going to be like this sort of like permanently stunted age-wise child who had been at the orphanage with him and that his mutant power was that like his projection of a hero and a villain and that's why Gambit and Mr. Sinister had a weird connection always and are so over the top and ridiculous because they were supposed to be like a child's drawings. That makes sense. Yeah, I love that. I I love that idea. It just never happened. It's great. Um, But but anyway, the point is, my point is just that Mr. Sinister is like visually and like in, in in affect, very silly. Totally. And um, <laughs> but I'd like some sort of big like globe something. Yeah, 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 yeah. And mostly I would really like to seed um uh, or really plant the seeds for in the this follow up movie to do a big Cassandra Nova story. Because I I love Cassandra I Nova. Love, I love Cassandra Nova. I love her like, you know, shape shifting evolving sentinels. Yeah. I really love that. And I think that's the th- kind of thing that you've gotta Well and like, I think that I think build. that actually Cassandra Nova was like the best because every writer who's ever tackled the X Men since like 
the beginning has done an issue that's like, is Xavier actually a good guy? To the point where we now are just like, no, he's not. And like, there's, that's not a question anymore. But I think that Cassandra Nova was the most effective thing because she was him, but evil. Right. With no compunctions about just being evil. Yeah. Um, and I think that that character was just so, so great. I love I the mean, worst next one so much. I mean, that, that first three-issue <laughs> story where it's just, it's so yeah. efficient. Just the opening page with Wolverine yeah. slashing the Sentinel and Cyclops saying, you don't have to do that anymore, Wolverine. Right. And, uh, and just, like, it ends with Professor Ash pulling out, like, a Glock and just shooting her. Yes. And... Yeah, and yeah, and one thing that's you know in terms of we're talking about the visuals, what the Morris X Men did that was so smart is they went to the black leather thing from the movies, kind of. Yeah. But they made it interesting. There was a yellow accent to everyone's costume that mm -hmm. tied it in visually with the yellow and navy stuff from earlier X Men iterations. Right. Plot the the blue and gold, if you will, and that um, I bet you never figured that one out, but that's <laughs> what that's from, um, and the. Uh, uh, the I actually it only occurred to me very recently and I was super embarrassed that I never <laughs> thought of it, um, but uh, the um, oh god the, the the so you've and everybody has a unique outfit spin that, like, on like it's them. a uniform but you but they look different right. and then Emma Frost is like to really contrast it just going I don't care I'm gonna wear white and have my boobs out because I don't care about respectability politics like that right. you know so that. But it, it visually identified every character. Yeah. While being something you could translate to film. Easily. And while the movie leather jumpsuits just are just the same. nondescript. They just all look like they're wearing the same like PVC outfit from you know. Yeah. I mean, they try to add like different color like piping. piping. It's, it's, but it's, it's so, so subtle that you can't really. It yeah. only really you only really can tell on the action figures. Of course. So Connor. Hi. You hard reboot the X-Men. Okay. What do you do? So this is going to be... It's, okay, so stay with me because it's going to sound a little weird at first, but I promise it's, it's good. So we open in the present. Xavier and Magneto have both been dead for a long time. They are like sort of iconic representations for political movements. Mm -hmm. The way that... Are there has, statues of them? There are statues, and like in the Morrison run, Magneto has become like a Che Guevara t-shirt type like symbol for radical yeah. youth. Um, and Xavier, meanwhile, is held up like MLK is by like, you know, the non-mutants as like, well, that's the right way to do things and mm -hmm. this and that and the other thing with like, you know, a sanitized portrayal of who he was and, and everything else. Not that, you know, in terms of well, he was completely nonviolent and was 100% peaceful and never did, you know, anything aggressive. And, like, it's like, that's not true, uh, you know. And, but I, that, like, that thing, go all the way in with it. Right. Um, and then you, um, then you have the new student who's a, a young woman. And I would have this be a completely original character. Oh. Bold choice. Yeah. Um... Now, it could be someone like the Deadpool Negasonic Teenage Warrior. Like, it could have a code name from right. the, But someone minor, because this is a character that you could then cross over into the comics. Right. And there will be fans who will be like, oh, Mary Sue, and this and that, and everything. But just to, to avoid that, just don't make her too powerful, don't make her too perfect, make her flawed and interesting, do the whole thing. Um, but like Kitty Pride, like Jubilee, like one of those things. Now, if this is too bold, just do Jubilee because they haven't done that yet, really. She's been like in the background in like every X Men movie. Did she have a line in Apocalypse? Uh, Maybe yeah. one. So you know, but but the point is, and so this character comes in, and she is a student with the established older team of X Men as her teachers, um, and. You flash back to the original X-Men. Now, because you want to keep them in the comic book range where they're all like 40-ish at maximum, mm -hmm. you say that the original X-Men adventures were in the 80s. Like, you just sort of have to make it work. But that team should be the actual original X-Men from the 60s, except you do what Ultimate X-Men did. You sub out Angel for Storm. Um, because I love Angel. My homosexual awakening when I was like 10 was a John Byrne drawing of Angel like in a tank top. It's that it's that issue of the Dark Phoenix stuff where um, Jean and Scott like have sex in a butte and because like on the Mesa because she's used her powers to take away his laser vision. I don't know. But, what you're but they're about. at like they're at Warren's ranch and he and Candy Southern are like drinking mojitos like and he's in this tank top with his like chest hair spilling out and he's like I'm so wealthy and gorgeous. Anyway, the point is with his giant wings, um, love Warren. 
anything Angel can do, Storm can do better. Yeah. So I think that um, you put Storm in there instead, because um, then you have the core team there. You have two women. You diversify it a little bit because right. the sixty team is all white. Um, and so you have that, and those are these sort of core people who've been here all along, except Jean is dead. Because the Dark Phoenix saga has happened, and she doesn't come back. Okay. And the reason I would do that is because then you have this sort of shared trauma that all of these X-Men characters who are older have, and they don't want to talk about it, and it's something that the young character can wants to know more about, wants to investigate. Why is Professor Summers so depressed all the time? Mm. Like, what is that? And you bring in Warren and Emma and a couple other more modern characters like Psylocke or whoever as, like, people who've invested now in the school and who are part of the X-Men and who came in later. But they're not part of this original team that had this traumatic experience. Right. And eventually you bring Jean in as the Phoenix, but like you do it in a way where she's like the specter in DC. Like she's sort of this cosmic Just entity. entity rather than a character. Um, I think that's how you do it because the problem with Phoenix at this point is that it's been adapted so many times that everyone knows the story. Right. And so I think that the way to do it is to have it have already happened and be this sort of like, that's the mission that went real wrong. Right. You know, and like then the plot, otherwise, you do something else. You do um, the Friends of Humanity, or I mean, that's what I would do now more oh, than yeah. anything else, is I would do the Purifiers or the Friends of Humanity. The Purifiers with Stryker and all that, I think, are a little bit cliche, but I think the Friends of Humanity do like an alt right thing. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and the new character should 100% not be white, this teenage character. Right. In fact, like, go with a Muslim actress. Do something. You know, like, do something that's, like, really, like, like if you want to update the X-Men, what you have to do is go back to what the real core thing is, which is, it's a, a story about oppression that is about placing subjectivity onto the oppressed people rather than just telling a story about them. So that's what I would do. Do dust. Dust, yeah. Dust. I mean, cool. I feel I feel like Hollywood probably wouldn't go for the full Abaya and Nikab and everything, but right. like, you know, they could have like a. I mean, a, 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 you know, she could be a hijabi, like you know, right. Oh, totally. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, dust is cool. Also, dust is also has a really cool visual power. Yeah. You know, and like then you have this Afghan Muslim girl who's the main character, and then you have like these very white Graydon Creed Friends of Humanity people, and you get the the metaphor, but it's also literal in a way that the storm and Kitty Pryce is. The stuff that was most memorable for me as a kid in terms of the mutant menace narrative is when Kitty Pride and sometimes they went a little much with it. Kitty Pride sometimes like drops racial slurs and stuff like, and you're like, yeah, the eighties. Yeah. But um, there is a sequence where like Nightcrawler is being hunted by like a mob, and I remembered it my whole life just because it's this very evocative moment that really crystallizes the the theme for me, which is that, you know. It's this very, it's this angry mob, and, and Nightcrawler is like this visually, you know, unable to pass mutant. And um, the guy, it's this like Chuck Norris looking guy who's like, you know, and Kitty Pride, who's like this 16 year old girl, is just like, you know, what is wrong with you people? Like, and it's this very, it's this long speech that she gives because Claremont was fond of having her like pontificate. But specifically, the thing that I love is that he says, he scared my kid. And she goes, you scare me. Does that give me a right to kill you? And, you know, she's like, uh, you know, a big chunk of my family was murdered in gas chambers because people were scared of them, you know, and, and what the influence, you know, that they held or whatever. Right. You know, the, and, and she really brings it home. She's like, she's like, so, you know, basically you're a Nazi. Um, and that to me is the heart of what, if you want to do it now. That, I mean, we are in a moment in which white supremacy and, you know, xenophobia and nationalism and all this other stuff is like on this very scary right. upturn. And if you want to make the X-Men current, it can't just be with, again, with all respect to Amy Acker, and I hope her show does well because I care about her career because I'm a fan, but... You know, you, you can't just be like, oh, my kid, and I'm a parent, and I'm concerned, or whatever. It has to be about the kids and their mentors who are trying to fight this and who are threatened and who are living every day in, 
you know, in mutant town and trying to fight the tide of people who hate and fear them. I right. mean, that's what it needs to be. But yeah. it needs to be an empowered position. It can't just be about hiding and running and eating sheep cake. Exactly. Like, I mean, like, <laughs> X-Men could and should be, like, really current and really relevant. So for me, yeah, I would have it be, like, the big adventures of the X-Men that you know about, like Dark Phoenix, have happened already. This is a new thing. But it's a new thing that feels like like the comic book. Like you just, you, I don't think that we can just keep retreading the Claremont stories. Right. But I think that you need to have the ethos. And that's sort of, that's sort of what I would say is the bottom line. I would see that. I, I think it would be good. That sounds pretty good. I think we did it. I think we I did think, it. I think we fixed the X-Men and at least, uh, you know, honestly, like, uh, you know, uh, it's, the odds are very, very, very low that any of the things that we would like to see would Whatever happen. happen. No. We, will, we will probably be, you know, Brian to be Singer will be making movies about, like, you know, Teen Colossus in 2035, and we'll just have to deal about it. With a new Xavier and Magneto With, yeah, and, and having the same just, debates. Yeah. So. No, it won't be new. It'll be, like, James McAvoy and Michael Fassbender will be, like, 80, and yeah, we'll still be doing Just, this. like, endless contracts. <laughs> but, uh, so we will probably continue to be disappointed and frustrated for years to come. <sighs> But um, it may be on. on but I call know. us. But call. We could do it real good. We got a lot of ideas, guys. <laughs> got a lot of ideas. Anyway, Connor, thank you so much. Thank for, you for having me. For this coming was a lot of fun. And, and I will always. This. I'm happy to always like talk about the X Men for hours. I uh, will do it forever. Well, look, when X Men come up, you know, there, there's only one person I call. Well, thank you. The expert, as it were. <laughs> I, oh, I'm totally putting a lower third in for you saying calling him an expert. Oh, I, I appreciate that. And, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. And uh, Connor, where can people find you and follow you? Uh, like I said, I'm a literary agent. Um, I work at the agency called Fuse, F-U-S-E. Um, so if you go to fuseliterary.com, you can read a little bit more about us and what we do. I primarily do sci-fi fantasy fiction. Um, I am also on Twitter which will presumably appear here below me. Right there. Um, and if you Google Connor Goldsmith, Connor like Sinead O and Goldsmith like a jeweler, you will find me. There are, it's like a weird Irish Jewish mashup name and there are only like three of us on the earth. So, uh, you know, it's not, I'm not the teenager who's obsessed with Katie Price and I'm not the guy who works at the KFC headquarters. The other one. There are like two, yeah, there are two other Connors that I've found. Connor Goldsmith. Perfect. But yeah, no, otherwise that's just me. And uh, I am always happy to talk about X-Men. So if you're an X-Men person who wants to talk more about anything I said here, please feel free to hit me up. Nailed it.